I've been in Israel for two weeks, and I had a great time, and I learned a lot of new, th new things. In fact, what's kind of interesting is, it doesn't matter how many times you go, you always learn something new. And I don't mean just one thing. There's just several things that you learn. And I hope that if you ever get the chance to go to Israel, that you'll take the opportunity and do it. Now, I don't know why, but there are certain people that say, well, I have no desire to go to Israel. I don't understand that because the Bible comes alive when you go over there and you actually see the places where Abraham was and Jacob and Esau and then you see where Jesus walked and this is where he performed this miracle. This is where he cast out this demonic spirit. But anyways, it's just a, a wonderful place to go and, and I had a great time besides just learning so many new things. Well, how many of you remember what we were studying before I left for Israel? How many of you say, no, I've slept since then at least for two weeks? Well, we were studying why it was necessary for God to destroy every man, woman, and child with the exception of Noah and his immediate family. In other words, why God sent the flood. So turn with me, if you would, to the book of Genesis chapter 6. I want to read verse number 5. It says, And God saw that the wickedness of men was great on the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Underline that word, imagination. Imagination is translated from the Hebrew word yetzer, which refers to the different aspects of a person's thought process. Now, when we talk about the different aspects of a person's thought process, we're talking about his thoughts, imaginations, intentions, motives, daydreams, plans, etc. So what this is saying in verse number 5 is that doing evil was the only thing that people thought about. They fantasized and daydreamed about doing evil things. They used their imagination to come up with new ways of doing evil. And then they contemplated on how to do it. And that's all they thought about. Every day, all day long. And not just one or two of them, because we have those type of people today. We have those type of people that don't think about anything else except doing evil. But what this is saying is, everyone was like that. With the exception of just a very few, Noah and his family. And that's what we were looking at. In fact, to really help you understand what this verse is saying, I want you to cross out that word imagination in verse number 5, and I want you to write the word aspect in its place. And let's read that verse again, and I want you to see what it's saying. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every aspect of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, verses 1 through 4 explain why the people became so wicked. It's because the sons of God left their natural habitation, and they had sex with the daughters of men. And they produced a super race of people that were known as the Nephilim. Let's read verse number 4 so you can get the picture. It says, The Nephilim were on the earth in those days when the sons of God went to the daughters of men and had children by them. They, the children, were the heroes of old, men of renown. So the Nephilim were half angel, half human. And if you want to get technical, they were half fallen angel, half human. But that also explains why they were so wicked. They were the offspring of fallen angels. They were technically the spawn of the devil or Satan's angels. Now, if you noticed, verse number 4 also says they became heroes, men of renown. And you can see why. Being half angel, they were superior physically to men or to humans. They were bigger, they were faster, they were stronger, they were quicker. And when you combine those two things, number one, they were evil, and number two, that they were heroes, you can see why they had such a corruptive influence upon men. It's because their heroes were evil beings. So in verse number five, we're told that doing evil was the only thing that men thought about. And that explains why it was necessary for God to destroy every man, woman, and child in the flood with the exception of Noah and his family. And people, God had no other choice. Now let me put it this way so you'll understand why God had no other choice. Had God allowed this evil to continue on, eventually even Noah's seed would have become corrupted. And then there would have been no 
chance for the seed of the woman to come. In other words, there would have been no chance for salvation. Because Satan would have been able to have stopped the seed of the woman who was prophesied to come, who would actually bruise the head or crush the head of the serpent. And so that was Satan's plans, but, but God came in and he changed all of that. And that's the gist of what we covered before I went to Israel. Now, tonight, I want to discuss the topic of demons. Because I know that when you start talking about fallen angels having sex with human women and creating a super race of people known as the Nephilim, it raises a lot of questions about the supernatural dark side. Am I right? In fact, let me do a little impromptu survey, if you don't mind. How many of you had never heard of the Nephilim up until a month ago? The majority of you. How many of you had never heard of fallen angels having sex with human women? You didn't even know it was in the Bible. Yeah, the majority of us. So when I started teaching on this, did it raise a lot of questions? How many of you went, oh my gosh, is that in the Bible? Did anyone think that way? Yeah. And so all of a sudden you start having all of these questions about, well, I didn't even know the, the, the devil's angels could do that. I didn't even know that that was possible. And so it raises a lot of questions, especially about demons and fallen angels, right? I thought so. So let's talk about demons tonight. Believe it or not, the word demons is not in the Bible. At least not in the King James Version. If you have the NIV or the New American Standard, you will find the word demons, but you won't find it in the King James Version. But you will find these terms. Unclean spirit, evil spirit, devils, seducing spirit, foul spirit, and familiar spirit. And those terms are used quite frequently in the Bible. In fact, evil spirit is used 13 times. Unclean spirit, 22 times. The word devils, and I want you to understand I'm saying it in the plural. Devils, not the devil, but a devil or devils. Does that make sense? That's used numerous times. Let me give you an example. Look with me, if you would, in the book of Luke, the 13th chapter, verse number 32. And he said unto them, Go and tell that fox. In other words, he's talking about Herod. You go till Herod. Behold, I cast out devils. First of all, there's no definite article before the word devils. So it's not talking about the devil. It's talking about a devil, and it's plural. So he said, you go tell them that I cast out devils, and I do cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. The term seducing spirits is used once. Foul spirit, twice. Familiar spirit is actually used 15 times in the Bible. And if we have a little bit of time, we'll talk about familiar spirits. And all of these terms are referring to what we would call demons. But what are demons? Does anyone know what demons are? In fact, that's not a rhetorical question. I'm going to take just a minute or two here. And if you think you know what demons are, why don't you tell me? What are demons? Demons are what? Fallen angels. Anyone else? What are demons? Fallen angels is what she said. Anyone else? Spirits. Any type of spirits or just spirits? Evil spirits? Um, imaginations, is that what she said? Imaginary things? Anyone else? What are demons? Okay. Well, there are three theories as to what demons are. The first theory is that demons are fallen angels. The second theory is that demons are the disembodied spirits of the pre-Adamic race. If you remember when we were teaching on creation, I told you that there are those that believe that the story of creation in Genesis chapter 1 is actually a recreation of the earth. They believe in something that is called the gap theory, that there is a gap of time between verse number 1 and verse number 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then it says, and the earth became what? Void and without form. 
And we found out that God doesn't do that. And so what they say is there is a gap of time between verse 1 and verse number 2. And that God actually created a race of people before he ever created Adam and Eve. And this race of people lived on the earth, but they sinned and they followed Satan when Lucifer fell. And as a result of that, God had to judge the world and he destroyed the world. And so they say that demons are the disembodied spirits of this pre-Adamic race. Now... The third theory is that demons are the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim that were killed during the flood. Now, which one of these theories is right? Well, the first theory is certainly the most popular. If I were to take a survey, most people would say that demons are fallen angels. In fact, let's do that. How many of you believe that demons are fallen angels? Hold your hand up high. Just go ahead and be proud. All right? How many of you really believe that, but you don't want to admit it in case you're wrong? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I know how you play it safe. Trick questions, what my brother Riddell always would say. He would say, you know, Alan, whenever you ask a question, I know not to raise my hand because it's going to be a trick question. No, 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 I have no trick question. I just want to know how many of you believe that demons are fallen angels. That is the most popular belief. Most people believe that. They believe that demons are fallen angels. But that seems to contradict what the scriptures say. Yeah. Most people believe that, but the truth of the matter is that goes against what the scriptures actually teach. And I'll show you why. Jesus taught that demons are disembodied spirits. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Matthew chapter 12, verses 43 through 45. In fact, most of what we know about demons is either found in the Old Testament or the Gospels. Jesus, in fact, taught us more about demons than anyone else. And I want you to notice what he had to say about demons. This is starting in verse number 43 of Matthew chapter 12. When an evil spirit comes out of a man, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Now, you need to understand what arid places means. Literally what it means is it goes through dry places. It goes through places where you're parched and you're uncomfortable and you feel like you're dying. That's what it means, all right? When an evil spirit comes out of a man, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Hmm. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied. Now, the word house there is the Greek word oikos, and it means home or house. Swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And they go in and live there. And the final condition of that man is now worse than the first. That is how it will be with this wicked generation. Now you need to understand, Jesus was teaching us some things about demons. And then at the very end, he says, and that's an analogy to this generation. But... This analogy does not disqualify what he taught concerning demons. And he gives us great insight to demons. I want you to notice that when an evil spirit, a demon, comes out of a man, Jesus says that it is now homeless. You see, demons want to use people's bodies as a home. Why? Because demons don't have bodies. They are disembodied spirits. And as you go through the scriptures, you'll find this time after time, that demons are disembodied spirits. You see, you have a spirit, and your spirit has a home. What is the home of your spirit? It's not a trick question. Where does your spirit live? Inside of your body. So your body, your physical body, is the home of your spirit. Does that make sense? Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. I'm going to have to lay down the basics. I can see that you guys are going, it's not that hard. We have a spirit. Our spirit can't just leave and go anywhere it wants. We're not talking about astral projection here. We're talking about our spirit living in a certain place. And the place that it lives, the home of your spirit, is your body. Notice what 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 3 says. For we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, 
Now, just in case you don't understand this metaphor, he's going to explain it. That is, when we die, we live this earthly body. So what he's saying, when this earthly tent, and the word tent there is the Greek word oikos, which means house. When this earthly house is taken down, it's destroyed, it's gone. That is when we die and leave this earthly body. So he's making an analogy. Your body is the home of your spirit. Let's go further. We will have a house in heaven. Now he's not talking about a physical house. How do we know that? Because we're going to continue reading and we're going to see that. He says we will have a house in heaven. An eternal body made for us. So what is this house in heaven we're going to have? It's a new house for our spirit. And then he tells us what it is. An eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. We grow weary in our present body. And we long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing. For we will put on heavenly bodies. We will not be spirits without what? bodies but did you see the analogy when this earthly home is destroyed it's taken down it no longer exists don't freak out your spirit is not going to be without a body God is going to give our spirit a new home in heaven and it's not going to be like this home here that tears down gets sick gets hurt aches and pains no God is going to give us an eternal home for our spirit. But I want you to see the analogy. Our body is said to be the home for our spirit. Did you catch that? I don't know if I can say it any clearer. So when you die, God is going to give you a heavenly home for your spirit. A heavenly body. But demons don't have bodies. In other words... They're a disembodied spirit. That's why demons seek to possess people. They need a home, a body. Because they don't want to be homeless. When a person's homeless, it's not only very uncomfortable, but their needs are not being met. There's not a place to store their food. There's not a place to go turn on the water and just get water. You're homeless. You're without the basic needs. And Jesus talked about this spirit. When it goes out of a man, it goes through arid places. That word arid places means that he doesn't have the things that he needs. He's parched. Those things aren't there. So what does he do? He can't find any rest. He can't find any comfort because there's no place for his spirit to be. He needs a body. So he says, let's go back to the home I was at. Let's go back to that man body and then he says you know what they might cast me out again so if there's nothing to take that place I'm gonna go get seven spirits more wicked than me and we're gonna go back and possess that body so we can't be thrown out again but what did Jesus teach us in this he taught us that demons are disembodied spirits does everyone catch that all right because that's very important for you to know that Demons don't have bodies, which means that demons are not and cannot be fallen angels. So you're all wrong. I know, I set you up, didn't I? You know, and all of those ones that thought, shoot, I shouldn't have put my hand up, so I wouldn't have had to admit that I believe that. Well, I'm sorry, but I want you to understand that just about everyone believes that. Somewhere down the line, we came across that and preachers started preaching that and it sounded really good. But the truth of the matter is, as you begin to study the Word of God, what you find is that Jesus taught and other scriptures taught that these demons are disembodied spirits. They don't have bodies. That's why they seek bodies. They'll seek even animals' bodies because they're looking for a home. But that also tells us that demons are not and cannot be fallen angels. Why? How do I know that? I know that because angels are not disembodied spirits. People, angels have celestial bodies. And they can also manifest themselves at times in a terrestri terrestrial body. In other words, a physical body. And I proved that to you several weeks ago when we talked about the fallen angels having sex with human women. 
Now, if you weren't here then, I'm not going to go into it. I don't have time to continually cover things that we've covered in the past. So if you were not here, I, I recommend that you go back and you get the DVD. And in that DVD, DVD, I prove that angels have celestial bodies. But not only that, they can manifest themselves into the physical realm. In fact, we went back even in the Old Testament and, and, and we found out that Lot entertained angels. We found out in the book of Hebrews, it tells us that many people have entertained angels unaware. They can actually look just like us. Angels have bodies. So if demons are disembodied spirits, they can't be fallen angels. Why? Because I told you, angels have bodies. Now, let me take this a step further if you don't mind. The book of Jude and 2 Peter tell us that the fallen angels who left their natural habitation and had sex with human women are being kept in chains until judgment. How many of you remember reading that in the New Testament? Maybe you didn't think about it, but you were reading along and you saw that. Well, let me just show you those scriptures if you don't mind. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of 2 Peter chapter 2. Let's read verses 4 and 5. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them into gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment. If he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others. Now the thing that I want you to see is when these angels sinned. Now here's what's interesting. In the Greek, this is talking about a specific type of sin. It's not just talking about they followed Satan. So we know because of the context that it's actually talking about uh, not following Satan, but it's actually talking about leaving their natural habitation. And we know that because of Jude chapter 1, verse number 6 also. Look at that. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now, this doesn't mean that all fallen angels are in chains. Actually, you have two different groups of fallen angels. You have those that are bound in chains, and Jude tells us why, and those that are free. Those that are bound in chains, in dungeons of darkness, they are the ones who left their natural habitation and they had sex with human women. And God realized that when he sent this destruction upon the human race, when he sent the flood, that if he didn't take care of these angels and they left their natural habitation, they'd do the very same thing. So God set them as an example is what Jude tells us. God took all of those fallen angels and he changed, chained them in dungeons of darkness as an example to the other fallen angels that if you leave your natural habitation, you listen to me. I will chain you up and you will never do anything like that again. And therefore, we have a second group. We have a group that are free. They rebelled with Satan, but they did not leave their natural habitation. And Paul refers to this group in the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verse number 12. Notice what he says. He says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. In other words, most of the time when we're having a problem, it's a spiritual problem. It's not a physical problem. We're not wrestling with people. I just can't go down and slap a hair lip on someone and make it better. You know, how many of you get upset with someone and you think, boy, I just need to go set them straight. I just need to go slap the fire out of them and set them straight. I want you to understand that usually it's not like that. They're being influenced by demonic spirits. They're being influenced by spiritual forces. And this is what Paul is talking about. He says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, why does he say in the heavenly realms? Because they have not left their natural habitation. They saw what God did to those angels who left their natural habitation and saw the daughters of men and went there and had intercourse with them. They saw what God did and they said, you know what? We're staying in the heavenly realm. We won't leave our natural habitation. So there are different classes of fallen angels and Paul is giving us these different classes. Now, there's no biblical evidence that these fallen angels possess people. 
They simply work against God's plan and use demons to fulfill their purposes. That's what the Bible seems to indicate. Now, let's look at the second theory. The second theory, demons are the disembodied spirits of the pre-Adamic race. People, that's speculation. We really don't have any scriptures to support that, so it's difficult to prove. It might be true, but there's no supporting evidence. It's just a theory. In fact, we look at that and we think, and I shouldn't say we because that includes me, but there are people who think that there was a gap between Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 and Genesis chapter 1 verse number 2. And that there was a race before Adam and Eve. And because of the sin of this race and the refusal to repent, God had to destroy that. And then in verse number 2, he reconstructed the earth. And that pre-Adamic race are now disembodied spirits. And those are demons. And they will point at certain scriptures, but there are no scriptures to look at and say, we can prove that beyond a shadow of a doubt. The third theory... The third theory is that demons are the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim. Those who were destroyed in the great deluge, the flood. Not only has, does it have scriptural support, but here's what's interesting. It was also the accepted view among the Jews at the time of Jesus Christ. Yeah. You see, the Jews believed at the time of Jesus Christ that when the Nephilim were killed in the flood, their half-angel half-human soul or spirit lived on just like ours does. And that's what demons are. They are the disembodied spirits of Nephilim. Now, some of you might be saying, now how do you know that Jews at Jesus' time believe that? Well, what's kind of interesting is you can actually study Jewish, Jewish demonology at the time of Jesus Christ. Because there's a lot of extra-biblical writings around the time of Jesus. We can place it back at that time, and we see what the Jews believed. In fact, the most common Hebrew word for demon at the time of Jesus Christ was Tamu Nephil. Tamu Nephil. Tamu, ne tamu Nephil is a compound word. Now remember what a compound word is. A compound word is a word that's made up of more than one word. In this case, it's made up of two words. It's made up of the first word, tamu, which means one who is dead or buried. That's the Hebrew word tamu. One who is dead or buried. And then the second word is nephil. Now, does that word sound familiar? When I was teaching on nephilim, we brought up the word or the Hebrew word nephil. Nephil is singular for nephilim. Nephilim is singular, Nephilim is plural. Now, when you combine these two words, Tamu and Nephil, it literally means dead Nephil. And that was the most common Hebrew word for demons at the time of Jesus in extra-biblical writings. So the common word for demons at the time of Christ was dead Nephilim. And that's what Jews believed at the time of Jesus. Demons were these disembodied spirits of the Nephilim that were destroyed in the flood. Now, let me go a little bit deeper and let me explain why the Jews believed that at the time of Christ. You know, it's one thing to tell you this is what the Jews believed at the time of Christ. It's another to show you why. And I'm going to do that. How many of you have ever heard of the book of Enoch? A few of you. It helped me if I can see hands lifted high. Okay, how many of you have never heard of the book of Enoch? Okay, we're about 50-50 here. So that lets me know how much I need to teach on this. All right? The book of Enoch was a very popular book during the time of Jesus. And two books in the New Testament actually quote from the book of Enoch. Did you know that? Yeah. The book of Jude actually quotes from the book of Enoch. And the book of 2 Peter quotes from it. And the book of Enoch specifically states that demons are the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim. In fact, if you don't mind, I'm actually going to read chapter 15 of the book of Enoch. Would you guys mind if I did that? It's kind of interesting to me. So you can follow along with me. I had uh, uh, Shirley type it in. But I'm going to read chapter 15, and then I'm going to emphasize the last four or five verses. It says, And he answered and said to me, and I heard his voice, Fear not, Enoch. Thou righteous man and scribe of righteousness. Why is he a scribe of righteousness? Because he's writing this down. It's the book of Enoch. Approach hither, 
and hear my voice. Go, say to the watchers of heaven. Who are the watchers of heaven? Angels, but more specifically, fallen angels. Watchers of heaven, because they're supposed to be in their natural habitation in the spiritual realm, watching what takes place. And it's only when they leave their natural habitation. Now you say, but Alan, there are times when the good angels, the angels of God come in and they come here. Yes, but it's on the direction of God. It's always because God wills it. He gives them the right to do that. So they're called the watchers. So let's keep going. And go say to the watchers of heaven who have sent thee to intercede for them. You should intercede for men and not for men and not men for you. Verse 3. Wherefore have you left the high, holy, and eternal heaven and lain with women? Now who's he supposed to be talking to? Fallen angels. So he told Enoch, go tell the fallen angels this. Wherefore have you left the high, holy, and eternal heaven and lain with women and defiled yourselves with the daughters of men and taken to yourselves wives and done like the children of earth and begotten giants as your sons? Where did we read that in the Bible? Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. And though you were holy, spiritual, living the eternal life. In other words, this is what God created you to do. You have defiled yourself with the blood of women and have begotten children and the blood of flesh as the children of men have lusted after flesh and blood as those also who do die and perish. Therefore have I given them wives also that they might impregnate them. And beget children by them. That thus nothing might be wanting to them on earth. But you were formerly spiritual. Living the eternal life and immortal for the generation of, of the world. And therefore I have not appointed wives for you. But for as, for as for the spiritual ones of the heaven and heaven. In heaven. In heaven is their dwelling. In other words God never said angels are to have sex. That's what it's saying. Now this is where I want to just zero in on verses 8 through 12. And now the giants who are produced from the spirits and flesh, half angel, half human, shall be called evil spirits upon the earth. And on the earth shall be their dwelling. Evil spirits have proceeded from their bodies because they are born from men and from the holy watchers is their beginning and primal origin. They shall be evil spirits upon the earth and evil spirits shall they be called. As for the spirits of heaven, in heaven shall be their dwelling. But as for the spirits of the earth, which were born upon the earth, on the earth shall be their dwelling. And the spirits of the giants, who are the giants? The Nephilim. Afflict, oppress, destroy, attack, and do battle. And work destruction on the earth and cause trouble. They take no food, but nevertheless hunger and thirst and cause offenses. Now listen to this, verse 12. And these spirits shall rise up against the children of men and against the women because they have proceeded from them. Now, the book of Enoch was written about two centuries, 200 years before Jesus. We know that because many of them were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. I shouldn't say many. I should say the book of Enoch was found among the scrolls of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So if you actually go to Israel with me sometime time we'll go to a place called Qumran and what we'll find is they found so many of the books of the Bibles in fact almost all of the books of the Old Testament were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls and can be traced back before the time of Jesus Christ so we know that the book of Enoch was written about two centuries 200 years before Jesus and what's kind of interesting is by the time of Jesus Christ most of the Jews believed and accepted the book of Enoch. In fact, well, as I told you, the book of Jude and the book of 2 Peter quotes from them. Does that make sense? Now, some of you are probably saying, well, I've never even heard of the book of Enoch. Tell me a little bit more about it. Well, let me explain something about the book of Enoch. It belongs to a group of books that's known as the pseudepigrapha. Anyone ever heard of the term pseudepigrapha? The term pseudepigrapha is... It re refers to this collection of books, and it is a collection of books that claims to be written by uh, well-known biblical characters, but they really aren't. That's why they are called pseudepigrapha books. You see, the word pseudepigrapha is actually a transliteration from a Greek word. 
And this word pseudepigrapha is a compound word. Remember what a compound word is. A compound word is a word that's made up of more than one word. In this case, it's made up of two. The Greek word pseudos, which means false or lie. And the Greek word epigraphi, epigraphi, which means to ascribe. Now, when you combine these two words, you get pseudepigrapha. And it literally means to falsely ascribe. In other words, to falsely attribute this, this book to someone else. So the pseudepigrapha is a collection of books that are falsely attributed to well-known biblical characters. The, the character Enoch, how many of you know who Enoch was? Enoch was the one who lived before Noah. And it says that he walked with God and he was no more. In other words, one day he was raptured up and he went to heaven and he's in the Bible. So this book says that it was written by Enoch, but we know that it wasn't. It's a lie. Now, every once in a while, someone will come to me and they hear this on TV or, they're here, or they'll be watching the Discovery Channel and they'll say, Alan, they had, a, they had this great series on the lost books of the Bible. And it was something called the pseudepigrapha. Why are this, th those books in the pseudepigraphy, why aren't they included in the Bible? And I have to tell them, well, think about it. Every book in the Bible is inspired by God and it's inerrant. Now, what do we mean by inerrant? We mean that it's without error. So if you've got a book that claims to be written by someone, but we know for a fact that it is not, that is a what? A lie. It is a false claim. So that alone disqualifies it from being in the Bible. Because the Bible is God-breathed. It's inspired. It's without error. So if we have a book that says, this book was written by Enoch, and we know for a fact that it was not written by Enoch, then that's a lie. So we cannot include it in the Bible. But that doesn't mean that there aren't some truths in some of the books. And let me give you an example to illustrate why I say that. This right here, is a history book. In fact, if, if you go to school, maybe you use this history book in the past. My library is full of all types of books, not just religious books, but I actually have books from other things. And this is a history book. But I want to tell you right up front that this is not inspired by God. And it's not inerrant. I can tell you without blinking an eye that I know that everything in it is not 100% accurate. In fact, I'm sure that if we studied it long enough, we would go and say, ah, that's not right there, and this is wrong over here. But at the same time, there's still a lot of truth in it. So I can get some good information out of it, right? Yeah. Well, the same holds true for many of the pseudepigrapha books. They're not inspired by God. They're not inerrant. But it doesn't mean that there's not any truth in it. And some of you might be going, oh, no, Pastor Allen said, no, 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 no. I'm not telling you to read the book. I'm not telling you. But here's why I said that. If Jude directly quotes from it, and Second Peter directly quotes from it, I have to assume that the things that quoted from are right. Because those books are in the Bible, and they are God-inspired, and they are without error. So when it quotes from the book of Enoch, those parts are true. Does that make sense? Now, you're thinking, well, Alan, why did you bring this up? Because I want you to understand that at the time of Jesus, the book of Enoch was accepted by almost every Jew. In fact, it wasn't actually discredited until about the third century after Jesus Christ. And then they, come in and they came in and said, even the Jews, oh, we can't accept this. And the reason we can is because they knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that it wasn't written by Enoch. And so they did not include it. But they also recognized that there were certain truths in it, or Jude and Second Peter would not have quoted from it. Now, the only reason I'm bringing this up, because I know someone's going to go out of here and say he's gotten weird, is that I'm trying to tell you that at the time of Jesus Christ, most of the Jews believed what was written in the book of Enoch, and this is, was the Jewish demonology at the time of Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? And that was their belief. Now, 
whether or not demons are the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim doesn't really matter. Did you hear what I said? Alan, are you saying that demons are the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim? I'm telling you, it doesn't really matter whether they are or not. What matters is that demons are real and that they existed in Christ's day and they exist today. So rather than speculating as to what demons are, we come in and we look at what the Bible has to say about demons. And we study what the Word says about them because they are real and they do exist today. So I'm going to use the next five minutes to give you some facts about demons. And I want to make sure you write this down because demons are real. First of all, Demons vary in wickedness and in power. Let me say that again. Not all demons are the same. There's not this one class of demons and they're all strong and they, no one's stronger than the other and no one's wicked, more wicked than the other. No, no, no. Demons vary in wickedness and they vary in power. And we know this because of what Jesus taught. Turn to Matthew chapter 12 verse number 45. Then the spirit finds seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they all enter the person and live there. And so that person is worse off than before. Because now, not only does he have more demons living inside of him, he has more demons that are more wicked than the first. That's why his condition is worse. Now look at Mark chapter 9, verses 28 through 29. And when he was coming to the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast this demon out? And he said unto them, This kind, different kinds of demons, they vary in power, they vary in wickedness. This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. You guys haven't spent enough time in the prayer closet. You haven't fasted enough. You don't have the relationship with God where the anointing is coming out. And this type can't come out without prayer and fasting. Now, if you remember when Jesus did this, he didn't have to go pray and fast. He just went over there and, and it was cast out. So he wasn't saying you go off to fast and pray. He says, no, 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 you have to have a life of prayer and fasting for this kind. Secondly, make sure you write this stuff down. It's good. Demons seek to oppress and entice people to sin and if possible, to possess a person. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 16, verse number 14. It says, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Now, this causes a lot of problems for people, because when they read the book of 1 Samuel, they'll find that it says quite often, an evil spirit from the Lord, and they go, oh my gosh. Does God send evil spirits? You have to understand something about the Hebrew language and Hebrew thought concerning God. The Hebrew thought concerning God is that God is sovereign. But in his sovereignty, he has given man a free will. See, Calvinists don't understand that. They say, well, you don't believe that God is sovereign. I say, of course I believe that God is sovereign. But cannot a sovereign God give man a free will? Of course he can. And Jews believe that. They believe that God is sovereign, but he gave man a free will. And because he's sovereign, everything comes from God. Not in the sense that he purposes it, but he allows it. And so what happened was when Saul began to sin, the Spirit of God left him, and because it left him, it left him void, just like what Jesus was talking about. And because there's a void, an evil spirit comes. And notice what it says, it troubles him. Now it doesn't say that Saul was ever possessed. But it troubled him. And in the Hebrew, that word means he was oppressed by those spirits. And so what would David do? In fact, I'm getting ahead of myself. What did his advisors tell Saul to do? They told Saul, you need to find someone to come and play worship. So they brought David in, and David came in, and he began to play music. Now, most people don't understand what that means. In the Hebrew, it means he began to play worship songs. And as they worship the Lord, God inhabits what? the praises of his people. And so as they began to worship, this evil spirit that was oppressing Saul had to leave because the spirit of God would come. Now, sorry. I just thought you'd like to know that. 
Look at James chapter 1, verse number 14. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Now, I want you to understand something. The devil doesn't tempt you. The devil entices you. Demons entice you. You are tempted by your own lust. And we all lust for different things based upon our personality and things we've opened up our lives to. I'll be honest with you. I don't go into a bank going, I will not rob this bank. I will not rob this bank. Oh, God, please. I will not rob this bank. I'm going to make a deposit. Okay. Oh, I will not rob this bank. And then I go out and go, Shoo. thank the Lord. Oh, that was so hard. I didn't rob the bank. I'm not enticed to rob a bank. You see, there are certain things that people lust after. But there are people, because of the way they, they are and the things that they've done, they're tempted by their own lust to steal. And so they really have to fight the temptation to steal. Some of you really have to fight the temptation for alcohol. Some of you really have to, to, to fight the temptation for drugs. Now here's what's interesting. These demonic spirits have been from, if they are disembodied spirits, they've been from almost the beginning of creation. Going all the way back to Genesis chapter 6. This is why they're familiar spirits. They've been around forever. And they probably watched your family. They've watched you. They know what you're tempted to do by your own lust. It's always interesting to me. I, I know a person in my family that's had a problem with drugs. And what's kind of interesting is this family would move. And the reason they would move is so that they could get this child into a different school with different friends. Thinking that it's their friends. And it's interesting, but there was more than one child in this family. And so when they would move, they had the one child that, man, as soon as he moved, he had all of these good friends. And the one that had a problem with drugs, it's like the very first day, every druggie was drawn to him. And it's like wherever he went, man, there were people enticing him to do drugs. Why? Because those demons knew what he was tempted by his own lust to do, and they came to entice Whatever you're tempted by your own lust to do, that's what the demons are going to entice you with. They're not going to entice you to do something you're not tempted by. Does that make sense? So demons seek to oppress people, and they seek to entice people to sin, and if possible, to possess a person. Now, let me explain what opens the door to demonic possession. Because a person cannot be possessed unless they open a door to the demon. Let me say that again. I don't have to worry. Oh my gosh, I hope I never get possessed. I don't have to worry about it. And I'm also going to explain when I do this why there seemed to be so much demon possession back in Jesus' day, but there's not as much now. But when we talk to missionaries, you go to certain countries and there's lots of demons' possessions, but there's not much in America. What's well, because we don't understand that a person cannot be possessed unless they open the door to a demon. So I'm going to give you the things that open the door to demons. All right? Number one, worship of other gods and idols. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 17. They sacrificed unto who? Devils. In the Old Testament, that means demons, not to God, to gods whom they knew not. Now, here's what's interesting. These demons are little g gods. Nephilim were seen to be what? Gods, where mythology came from. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up. In other words, were created, not the omnipotent, omniscient, all-eternal God whom your fathers feared not. So, here's what's interesting. You go to countries like India, you go out to the Asian countries, you'll find a lot of demon possession. You know why? Because they worship other gods and idols. That opens the door for demonic possession. I don't see a lot of people in America going, I want to worship the Hindu god, la la la. But we do find it every once in a while, and guess what? Many of those people are possessed by demons even in America. Why? Because that opens the door to demon possession. Number two, involvement in occultism. 
Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 10 through 12. For example, never sacrifice your son or daughter as a burnt offering. That would be to a god or to demons. And do not let your people practice fortune-telling or use sorcery or interpret omens or engage in witchcraft or cast spells or function as mediums or psychics or call forth the spirits of the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the, Lord, to the Lord. It is because the other nations have done these detestable things that the Lord your God will drive them out ahead of you. But here's what's interesting. All of those things opens the door to a demon. And they begin to oppress and as you continue to open that door, eventually what begins to take place? You think you're the medium to the person who lived 600 years ago and it's speaking through you. That's a demon. You open the door to that demon. Did it know what happened 600 years ago? It's been here ever since creation. Or at least Genesis chapter 6. Last but not least, and we're going to end here. Five after and we're stopping. Drugs. There is no such thing as recreational drug use. If you're a druggie, you are opening the door to demonic oppression. If you continue to do it and you get addicted enough, you will be possessed. I can see it in certain people's eyes, literally. I'm telling you, I've been in certain places where there's druggies and I come in and I can literally see those demons inside of them. Turn to Galatians chapter 5, verse 20. These are the works of the flesh. Idolatry, now notice this, witchcraft. The word witchcraft is translated from the Greek word pharmakia. Our word pharmacy is transliterated from that Greek word. It means mind-altering drugs. Mind-altering drugs was always considered to be in the Bible witchcraft. It was a way to open your mind up to devils. Do you have hallucinations? Do you see? Look at my head. Wow. You're opening yourself up to demons. That's what the Bible says. But I'm here to tell you, you cannot be possessed unless you open the door. And that's why you don't see that much in America, but you will see it in foreign countries. But I guarantee you, you get in certain places in America, I'm going to tell you one night, I'll tell you one story, and I'm quitting. But I went down to pray for a person. The Holy Spirit spoke to me and says, do not touch this man. And I disregarded what the Holy Spirit said. And I laid hand on this man and began to pray. And that night, I was so sick. I was sicker than a dog. I was throwing up. It was horrible. And, and of course, I said, Lord, what is wrong? And I'm praying for my healing. And the Holy Spirit, I went back to bed. And as I was praying, the Holy Spirit actually showed me this person. In fact, what's kind of interesting, the face of this person... My eyes were open, literally came a spirit. And that face of that person was right there, except it had demon eyes. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, I told you not to lay hands on him. And that's why the Bible says, lay hands on no man suddenly. I said, ah. I said, I take authority over you in the name of Jesus. Spirit, leave. Immediately. No more upset stomach, no more nausea. Nausea. No more stomach cramps. People, I'm here to tell you, demonic spirits are real. I could go on and tell you story after story.